Well, um, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening's BSR online lecture, which comes to you this evening, as I was chatting with Paul beforehand, um, from the archaeology offices at the BSR, known affectionately to many as the Cameroni, um, which Molly Cotton, in whose memory we hold this uh, annual lecture, was instrumental in setting up and leading for many years. Molly Cotton trained as a doctor at the London School of Medicine for Women at St Mary's Hospital. In 1928, she married Dr Thomas Cotton, a cardiologist, and retired from medical practice. Shortly after, Molly went to a trip to Greece and subsequently spoke of it of a moment when she converted to archaeology. In 1936, she was one of the first to take a postgraduate diploma at the newly founded Institute of Archaeology London, where tonight's speaker also graduated some years later. She became a close friend of Tessa Mortimer Wheeler, who you can see in one of these photos here, and was assistant director of the pioneering excavations at Maiden Castle, conducted between 1934 and 1938. Post-war, she continued to excavate with Sir Mortimer Wheeler at Hod Hill, Virilanium, Colchester, and Clausentum. After her husband passed away, Molly moved to Rome and she became closely connected to the British School at Rome. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, she played a major role in the school's archaeology program, working closely with the then director John Ward Perkins, directing excavations to the Roman Republican villas at Posto and San Rocco near Francoles in Campania, as well as closer to Rome along the Via Gabina. Alongside her many important publications, Molly, has also, Molly also started a foundation, which between 1972 and 2008 provided funding for fellowship awards, grant publications, and other donations for the study of archeology, span architecture, history, languages, and the arts of the culture of the Mediterranean. The British School acknowledges the importance of Molly's research, and her tremendous support through the, for the school through an annual lecture, which we're attending this evening in her memory and on subjects were close to her own interests. So then passing to this evening's uh, event, it's my great pleasure this evening to welcome Professor Paul Arthur to give our annual Molly Cotton Lecture. Paul has a long association with the British School at Rome having assisted Molly in the Cameroni after school and then later returning as a Rome scholar in 1981-1982, following the completion of his PhD at the Institute of Archaeology, London. I note with great pleasure that in the introduction to his book, Romans in the Northern Campania, the first in the BSR monograph series, that his interest in Campania, uh, Campania in archaeology grew from it, his discussions with Molly Cotton Martin Fredrickson. He has held various teaching appointments at the University of Salerno from 1985 to 1987 and at the University of Lecce, now Salento, between 90, since 1990, where he currently holds the Chair of Medieval Archaeology. He directed the Postgraduate School of Archaeology between 2013 and 2019. In 2018, Paul was elected to the prestigious position of the president of the Italian Society of Medieval Archaeology. He is also a fellow of the Society of Antiquities and member of the various, various learning societies, having also been nominated as associate of the Board of the International Center for Medieval Art in New York in 2005. He is also a member of various editorial committees in Italy and abroad. Paul recently received a major funding from the Italian Ministry of Education for research project Byzantine Heritage of Southern Italy, Settlement, Economy and Resilience in Changing Territorial Landscape Context. I'm delighted to welcome him this evening as he speaks on this topic, Searching for Identity, Byzantine Southern Italy. And at this point, Paul, I pass over to you um, and so you can um, if you wish to start your uh, PowerPoint from the share screen, and I will stop my video and um, and mute myself as well. All right. Thank you, Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much for your brilliant presentation. Let's see if I can start uh, 
uh, getting this going. No, what's that? Uh, this always takes a, a few seconds because oh, it's sort of open. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, you'll be able to help me with this. Um, yep, yeah, you can just, um, uh, you can minimize that one. Um, the, the PowerPoint was perfect, the one you had there before. This one. Yep, yeah. and then go a bit further than that button there. Yep, yeah, perfect. Um, yes. Good. Excellent. You've got it. All over to you now, Paul. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, what I want to do, well, this is just a, a lovely reconstruction that was done by one of my uh, students. You'll see it once again. It's the Byzantine Church of St. Peter's in Otranto that I uh, invite everybody to go and, and see. It really is a splendid jewel. And it seems almost quite out of place in, in its current context because it does look as though it should be somewhere in Greece. I'm sure you've seen many similar churches in Greece. Um, but this has a, a, an incredible um, series of fresco, fresco paintings on the uh, inside walls, including, I must say, the um, washing of the feet and the use of lapis lazuli, which came all the way from Afghanistan. So we're talking about 10th century uh, Byzantium in Italy with contacts, uh, far-reaching contacts as far as Afghanistan, but through itinerant traders. But before I want to get into my project, I'd like to spend a few words on uh, Molly as well. It's the same um, photograph that I, I stole from the British School of Rome. Um, there's Molly sitting in, I believe, the director's garden. Uh, Molly, as I remembered her, because uh, as Stephen was saying earlier on, I was at the British School in the mid-1970s as a schoolboy, um, 16 years old, I believe, and Molly, uh, 16 or 17, and Molly took me under her wing. I remembered splendid dinners together, and uh, I even decided to do my A-level in archaeology because of Molly and because of my mentor there, was Amanda Claridge. I put at the feet of Molly, or to, to the side of Molly, one of the small um, uh, mosaics that came out from one of her excavations of the Franco Lise villas that uh, were referred, referred to early on. I believe this is from the San Rocco villa, which was the largest one in, in the area she excavated. And these were important for me as well, because when I decided to write my doctorate on, uh, on Italy, uh, I, I had been spending three years excavating with Andrea Carandini in the Agia Cosanus. Um, and I was absolutely flabbergasted by the sort of things that Andrea Carandini was finding. But then reading the ancient texts, I thought, well, yes, there was the Agia Cosanus, but then there was the even greater and more fertile Agia Falernus which was not the subject of a PhD. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and do a little bit of one-upmanship with Andrea Carandini and go and do my survey in the Agia Falernus, which is where the Franco Lise villas were. And Molly helped me with that. She was very, very enthusiastic. We chatted about this and she asked me to review her two volumes on the, on the Franco Lise villas, which I promptly did, saying I hope very nice things. Um, and, and we became, became very, very great friends. Um, just two years before she died, I decided to get married. And I remember her being extremely generous with my, uh, my wife and uh, daughter to come. And I was extremely set, some upset that just two years later she, she passed on, but left with me a, a, a strong, um, strong feeling in my in my heart and my memory. So I feel that I, I owe, a lot, owe a lot to Molly, who introduced me to the Italian archaeological circles and made me feel very much at home at the British School at Rome, especially when uh, I was there as a Roman scholar. But uh, I, I won't uh, carry on with Molly. I just wanted people to know how, how much I appreciate what she's done for me and that she will ever be by my side. Um, instead, I want to now move on to the real thrust of my lecture. Now, I think people recognize these slides or recognize more or less where these slides may be. 
They represent southern Italy. Well, you see, southern Italy has long been recognized as a distinctive part of, uh, of the peninsula. Um, as many people would know, it's also called the Mezzogiorno, midday of Italy. It's the so-called hottest part of Italy, um, sometimes the most arid part of Italy, but also one of the most beautiful parts of Italy with varied landscapes from the uh, cave shelter to cave towns such as Matera, which you'll see in the, in the lower slide, to the Trulli and Alberobello, to a stretch of coast, I believe, along the Calabrian um, Tyrrhenian coastside. A, a beautiful place to be, an exciting place to be, not without its economic difficulties, but for some reason, uh, well, economic economics basically, this part of Italy has never really developed as has the center and particularly the north. So whereas the center and north are for some reasons likened to the rest of Europe, this area is seen as a somewhat poor agricultural land. Now, the fact that this area has never been really properly industrialized has also led to the fact that this area um, has maintained many of its older traditions without big skyscrapers um, pushing away old uh, buildings, traditional buildings, without great big uh, urban plans, as I say, for one or two. Well, I mean, just to think of Naples, Naples still has its, its ancient Greek street pattern, which is quite surprising. So there seems to be a fair amount of preservation. But one of the questions is preservation of what? What has been preserved? What can we see in uh, modern Southern Italy? Well, to many people, the characteristics of Southern Italy today are often seen as being formed during centuries of Greek colonization. People often re refer to this area as Magna Graecia or Megale Alas, um, as though it was still part of Greek territory. Or alternatively, in more recent times, Southern Italy has, seen, has been seen as a unified bloc through the unification by the Normans and later through the 19th century unification of Italy. I wanted to show people um, some words that I picked out in Wikipedia. Now, I'm not one of those scholars who thinks that Wikipedia is the best source for historical information. But it is very, very useful for, on another level because Wikipedia tends to give us an idea of what most people think about single subjects. So I looked up Mezzogiorno and Mezzogiorno tells us la cultura del meridione italiano è il ricco portato delle sue varie esperienze storiche, fra cui la plurisecolare presenza greca, il perdurante lascito degli arabi e dei normanni, nonché una qual certa influenza spagnola, which literally translated, at least by myself, would be the culture of the Italian South is the rich bearer of its various historical experiences, including the centuries old Greek presence, that is Magna Graecia or Magali Alas, continuing legacy of Arabs and Normans, as well as some Spanish influence. Now, no mention whatsoever is made of Byzantium. And nor for Rome, of that matter, for that matter. So, uh, but if we think of our period, if we think of my period, well, the one I'm studying of, of uh, Byzantine occupation, we, are, we have lost in this summary, 500 years, half a millennium of history that must have contributed to the development of Italy. So that is one of the uh, main reasons why I have decided to, to apply for the Italian funding, fund for Italian project. Now, personally, I've been living in this area for more than 30 years. I spent 10 years in Naples, and I've spent over, well over 20 years living in uh, in Salento. So that's over 30 years of my life living in southern Italy. I mean, I know the rest of the country, but I can see the differences and I can see what seems to be uh, the characteristics of southern Italy. I think that if somebody blindfolded me and dropped me anywhere in Italy, I could take off the blindfold and say, I'm in the south or I'm in the north. That they are, they are that different. Language wise, dialects, food, architecture, traditions, ways of greeting people, 
friendliness. Um, in, in lecture, people will, call, will give you two, they'll call you two, not lay, even if they don't know. You walk into a shop and say, uh, two because of oi. And then you'll buy your things and walk out of the shop and they say, ciao. It was a bit unnerving in the beginning after having learned Italian, but uh, that's the way things are. So after 30 years living in this area, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the leading characteristics of Italians, of Southern Italy, um, owe much to some half a millennium of Byzantine domination. I mean, I can't get this out of my head. I still think, in some ways, 500 years of Greek empire have still conditioned modern Italy. I also believe that the preservation of Southern Italy during the second half of the first millennium was of fundamental importance to the empire for its own continued continuity and resilience. So those 500 years were not just 500 years of foreign people here. There were 500 years of the Byzantine Empire trying to make the most of its Western territories. So I have now three years of a well-funded project to be able to disprove these ideas with major funding from the Ministry, Italian Ministry of University, Education and Research. So what of the project? Here we have the project, um, the Byzantine, oh, sorry, uh, the Byzantine heritage of Southern Italy, settlement, economy and resilience in changing territorial and landscape contents. As you will, you'll see a few things from these slides. First of all, the project, which is a PRIN, a Progetto di Rilevante Interesse Nazionale, uh, paid for totally by the Italian Ministry of Education, uh, foresees four different research groups. Now, the main research group, of which I am PI, is the University of Salento. Then we have the University of Foggia, which is Northern Puglia, the University of Calabria, uh, which is at Cosenza, the University of Catania in Sicily, and the University of Basilicata. Now, the University of Basil Basilicata is an aggregated group because the law only permits us to have four formal groups, that is four groups that would be financed by the project. So the University of Basilicata, through a little bit of my uh, cajoling and persuas persuasion, has decided to come in uh, fully aware of the fact that I won't be passing them one single euro. But they were enthusiastic by the the, of the project and felt that their help would be fundamental in forging ahead. Now, if you look at the slide in the top right-hand corner, you will see more or less the area of competence for the project. It's marked in orange and comprises Puglia, Basilicata, Calabria and Sicily. Basically, the areas that were regained by Emperor Basil I the Macedonian in the late 9th century, apart from Sicily, which in those very years was being lost, to the empire. But I'm concentrating on the 7th, 8th, 9th and 10th, when I believe the main characteristics actually came to the fore. And so that is why I've chosen this area to concentrate on. You can see why, had there not been the University of Basilicata, we would have had a big hole in the middle of our territory, rather like somebody using a tooth. So for continuity, we've uh, managed to have five different teams. Now, this is very much a project right at the beginning. We are uh, deb debutants. Um, so if the British School will kindly invite us back in three years time, we'll be able to recount also the success or insuccess of the project. I'm telling you what we want to do and in three years time I'll be able to tell you what we've been able to do. So here we are, the project once again, but this is the official website. If you see below, there's an HTTP by Santan Italy, by Santan Italy dot unisalento dot it dot word, uh, slash WordPress. Now, if you go on that website, this is the home page, you'll be able to explore a number of uh, things. You see home, project, research, keep, publications, temata, 
news links um, Italian or English. You click on Italian and then you can get an English text as well. So if you want to read in English, there's no problem. So this is our main, um, our main spokesman for the project during the course of the project. Of course, we will be coming out with publications until the majority of publications will appear at the end of the project. But to ensure publications, I've come, I've created a second thing, which is a monographic series. And the monographic series is called Temata. It's a bit of a play on words between the theme as a, an administrative subdivision of the empire and theme as a subject or topic, which each book will speak about. And the first volume has just appeared. It's called From Polis to Medina, La Trasformazione della Città Siciliana e Trattato Antico Alto Medioevo. This is an excellent book, um, edited by Lucia Acifa, who is the head of the group in Catania, and by the uh, sadly departed Maria Scarlato, who was also a Byzantinist working in Sicily. And this volume is dedicated to the development of cities or towns between late antiquity and early medieval uh, times in the island. So there will be a lot to read and this one can be read straight away. The next volume that's coming out will be on glass produced in uh, Byzantine southern Italy. Now, these, these are the first projects that we, the first um, systems of outreach of our, uh, our big budding project. But let's get into the thick of things, the why, the why, and the where, how of the project. Well, um, a quick recap of what happened in Italy. Well, as you know, the empire fell, and as Momigliano uh, said, it fell without a thump in the night. Nobody actually heard it fall, but it fell in 476 AD. It then uh, fell into the hands of the Ostrogoths. The Ostrogoths were quite wily people and decided they would step down as kings so they could then bow their towel out and, 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 and toe to uh, the wishes of the emperor in Constantinople. And this was all quite all right. It seemed to work very well, especially under Theodoric, who was very careful to uh, not upset the Byzantine government. But when Theodoric died, it was the excuse for the Emperor Justinian to move into Italy and recapture the West, uh, as in the good old days. His idea was to reunite a Mediterranean empire. So he attacked Italy, did a Sicilian beachhead landing, fought the way up the coast, Numbers, uh, numerous sieges in Naples, uh, Cuma, Rome, elsewhere, and in the space of 20 years were able to really recapture the whole of the peninsula and the islands. But Justinian was, was pretty much unfortunate. He may be called Justinian the Great, but in 568, only a few years after the end of the Twenty Years' War, another population group, the Lombards, moved into Italy. And in the space of two or four years, they moved from northern Italy right down to southern Italy to a place called Benevento, which is even further south than Gaeta, and took most of peninsular Italy, leaving bits and pieces, crumbs, one might say, such as the um, St. Peter's, Rome, uh, Ravenna, and the Pentapolis, Naples, the lower part of the Salento, the lower part of Calabria, Sardinia, and Sicily. The rest were all Lombard territories. Well, um, now we can stay there a second. Um, just over a dozen, dozen years later, as I say, Italy was lost to the Lombards. But by some time, um, interests in southern Italy did not stop with Justinian's uh, defeat or the defeat, let's say, of the, of the empire by the Lombards. A certain emperor called Basil I, the Macedonian, towards the late 9th century, between the 870s and 880s, decided that he'd recapture the West. 
Well, he decided to recapture the West because this was a period of great inroads by Saracen mercenaries or Saracen uh, marauders. Rather like the Vikings in the North, the Saracens in the South were looking for slave labor. They needed the slave labor to create the large um, Arab empire, which had been centered on uh, Damascus, but by 800 AD had been shifted to Baghdad. Now, as they were originally a, a nomadic society, they didn't have the know-how to create this incredible, these incredible cities, and incredible architecture with baths and music, and culture, and reading, and everything that Byzantium did have. So slaves, slaves, slaves as it was, and hundreds of thousands of slaves were taken east and died sooner or later between Damascus, Baghdad, Bastra, and who knows how many other sites. It would be interesting, very interesting one day to actually go and discover some of these slaves and do a little bit of, uh, of analysis, of genetic analysis, and see if we can find where they actually came from. Well, uh, let's see. It's there. Well, with the reconquest of Emperor Basil I, things started to change very, very quickly. If you look at this uh, chart of coin finds, you will be able to make out, uh, well, you can't actually see the name of Basil I, but if you go to the end of the ninth century in blue, you will suddenly see reaching the age of the end of the ninth century between the second half and the uh, second quarter, sorry, third quarter, and last quarter of the ninth century, there is a gradual peak in Byzantine coins, which reach an incredible um, peak by the time of the emperors Constantine the Eighth and Zoe and Romanus. They come mainly from Otranto. And then you get, in the following years, the continuity of use of those coins, plus new pools of coins that create a monetized economy. So between the end of the Justinianic War, let's say between uh, the early 7th century and the later 9th century, this area, Salento, Southern Puglia, was basically a uh, barter or natural economy. And it was with the reconquest that suddenly pools of money were brought in ostensibly to pay um, the administration, the army, and also to recoup money in the form of taxation. But this meant that people, everyday people, would suddenly enter into a market economy and exchange would be made far, far, more, uh, um, far more easy for everybody. Well, I don't want to dwell on why Byzantium expended so much energy in wanting to keep Italy and Sicily within the empire. I think on a, a more theoretical, ideological point of view, there was the traditional feeling that the West belonged to Constantinople. And, and so this idea that it was historically part of the empire meant that Rome and Italy could not so easily be relinquished but had to be uh, kept hold of as part of the empire. And that, that survived for quite some time actually. Rome, Ravenna, Naples and parts of the empire until around the mid 8th century if not a little later. Then they gradually moved towards independence. With the loss, the, a second factor is that with the loss of North Africa, and particularly of Egypt, of the very fertile Nile Valley, um, Byzantium suddenly found that it didn't have enough resource areas for grain, olive oil, and other primary necessities. So instead of looking to Africa and Egypt, which have been heavily conquered and now strongly held by the Arabs, they thought, well, in the West, we do have some very fertile areas, such as Campania, such as parts of the South, and such as the Alba Sicily. And so we suddenly find an enormous investment of Byzantine Empire 
in those areas, which is one of the reasons why, even in 663, the Emperor Constance II decided to move his capital to Syracuse. It was a very unfortunate move because he was killed while he was having his ablutions, I believe, by his treasurer, who stabbed him a number of times. Um, perhaps he uh, did not find, find, uh, form part of a, an Eastern Constantinople lobby, and so he paid for his life with his ambitions. But you see, um, another thing, another fact not just the resources of the empire, not just what Sicily and southern Italy could give the empire, but what could be had from further along. Now, if we look at these two uh, illustrations, we have this lovely map um, that was drawn up by a bit of Caitlin Green, who shows you the distribution of early Byzantine finds outside the boundaries of the, of the mid sixth century empire. They get all over the place to Japan, to Southern Korea, China, Indonesia, Egypt. There's an absolute mass of things. The steppes, Russia, um, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, Sub Saharan Africa, the Northern Europe, even as far as Scandinavia and places like Ireland. So Byzantium was looking far afield to try and. Uh, retain, regain resources needed for the empire. And I've put this little stone, which I've never seen personally, but I just came, came across, a few, across a few days ago, as a lovely little example of how even in the late sixth century, Emperor Justin II could be recorded on a stone, the Pen Macros, Macno stone in Northern Wales. You see there's a consular date, most probably referring to the successive consulships of Emperor Justin II. So there's a constant um, movement, a constant uh, link between uh, the centre and the periphery, the centre and what is within and what is without. Many of you will know these stories also through the tales of what have been found at places like Tentagel or even more so Glastonbury or the early monks in the, uh, in the Irish Peninsula. But not all, all traits of Byzantium were necessarily intentional. Oh, here's just one more slide to show you the way that uh, Byzantium linked to the outside world. This is one of my favorite characters, Willibald of Wessex. Willibald was born in Wessex, a holy man, and he decided decided in the worst years of Byzantine um, communications, mainly because of the Arabs, to move from, um, from southern England to the Holy Land in the years 721, 724. So he left Hamwick, now Southampton, crossed France, got to Italy, but was not really in true Byzantine hands until he hit uh, Rome to some extent, and then Naples that was still a duchy of the empire. From Naples, he then remains in Byzantine territory to cross down to places like Messina, Syracuse, Reggio, cross over, perhaps even Otranto, dropping down to the Peloponnese, sailing around the Aegean, the south and uh, southern Asia Minor coast, until he gets to Palestine, and finds that he's in an area which is no longer under Byzantine control. But he is able to see the famous sites that uh, the wife of Constantine, Helena, had decided to elevate to important Christian sites. And then he walked all the way back. He got as far as a place called Eichstadt, which you can see right in the center of the map in Germany. He got as far as Eichstadt, there he was ordained, and became Bishop of Eichstadt, and that's where he passed the rest of his life. But it does show that some people, although Willibald was something of an exception, could cross in and out of the empire for various motives. And this happened certainly on a political level, on a religious level, and I'm quite certain it happened also on the level of exchange within and without the empire. 
So this takes us to uh, what I call questions of identity. Um, there are a number of uh, studies recently uh, on identity. Um, these, these studies seem to be more linked to questions of ethnicity, especially when uh, they come out of studies that want to examine the Lombards or the Anglo-Saxons or the Franks or the Carolingians. So what, what would be the other to the Byzantine, um, Byzantine uh, populace? Uh, there's a lovely contemporary book that, that, and, and recent studies that speak about Byzantium and the others, that is, who is not part of empire. A little bit the same as, as the Romans did. You know, you are Roman or you're not Roman. It doesn't depend how you think. It depends on what part of the land, what side of the frontier you live on, and if you pay us taxes, or if your taxes go so, so, so well, somewhere else. So, although I've been reading these books, they don't quite hit the sort of thing that I personally want to do. Because I want to examine um, identity as part of Byzantium. Which of what makes people Byzantine? What makes people Byzantine? I mean, when you speak about a Byzantine population, you're speaking about the old Roman population, the autochthonous population. You're talking about people, Greeks, coming from Greece and Asia Minor, and Cyprus and goodness as well else to uh, come and bolster Byzantium and come and be part formally of Byzantium. Um, it's it was very much a sort of minestrone, uh, mix match of people arriving from all over the empire. I think we must play down the idea of thousands of fleeing monk, monks and that every cave church in southern Italy is a, a, a church built by a monk. It's absolute rubbish. Most cave churches are actually small village churches, and caves were used because they were less expensive than actually building subdivo. Um, but undoubtedly, enormous numbers of people came into Italy. And we can see just from the material culture how uh, Byzant Byzantine southern Italy actually was. So here we have just a few examples. We have examples of language and religion. Well, look at the lovely 11th century inscription, which was built to commemorate a tower uh, during the fight with George Maniaches, who was a, a person who had taken the imperial power in Syracuse and was marching on Constantinople. Um, he died in 1042, but here we have a, a, a perfect uh, inscription that looks as though it could have been created in a workshop in Constantinople. Below you have this Church of St. Peter's again at Otranto, that uh, archetypal Byzantine church, and next to it we have a, a, a very simple bread stamp. A simple bread stamp, I say simple, but it's an interesting bread stamp because it dates to about the 10th century and has its exact parallels in the clay and in the decoration in Corinth, look at the Corinth reports, in Istanbul, and even on a small site called Eleusis Sebaste, which is worth, worth, towards the uh, um, eastern part of Eshoroida. So I think these things help to create a strong sense of uh, identity. Um, these go on, well, go on and show you globular amphorae or let's say shared material cult, uh, shared material um, objects. Here's a number of objects that I used to create a network analysis. The network analysis can be seen based on those objects in the map. And if you look at the map, the network analysis will link all these objects found on a large number of sites and most of them touch the areas that are in, not in green, but in yellow, the yellow areas which are part of the empire. So there's a very, very strong 
network that continues through uh, Byzantine times, um, but we can still see today through careful archaeological excavation. Then we have, uh, we have dress accessories, and probably dress itself, going by some of these surviving uh, wall paintings in Byzantine churches. But here we have a couple of buckles. The buckle in the top left is known as the Corinth buckle, because many have been found in Corinth. But they've been found in Corinth throughout much of southern Italy, in Sicily, in Bulgaria, in Greece, in the Ukraine, and some even further afield to the east. That simple uh, perforated buckle is representative of Byzantine culture. The same goes for the slightly rarer, uh, I call B, uh, D buckle, um, which is all done by the same artist, the same artist only because they have the same uh, decoration with this sort of funny, funny, um, what do you call it? Uh, um, creature that, 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 that will, will appear again and again and again. Um, earrings. The earrings are earrings of Constantinople type. Whether they were made in Constantinople, Constantinople we don't know, but they appear in Otranto, in Paris and Otranto. They appear in Taranto. They appear in Sicily. So there is a sort of, if I may say, if I may use this word slightly incorrectly, there is a sort of major, all-enclosing Byzantine koine across the empire, east and west. And this is important because many Byzantine scholars uh, who work in the central parts of the empire often tend to think that Italy was marginal, was peripheral, was not really part of the empire. But our project is going to show that it was a fundamental part even for the survival of the empire. Other items, chafing dishes. Well, I find these particularly interesting. I don't know what they were used for. Um, I suspect they may be like the Turkish mangal for making things like uh, polpette or small meatballs. But I've made a distribution of the chafing dishes and you'll see the um, eighth century empire in penicillin collar, collar, and you will see the black dots representing the discovery of chafing dishes. There are a few outside of the uh, empire. There's one in Bukov in, uh, in, 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 in Romania, uh, closely linked to Byzantium. Paphos in Cyprus, which had been Byzantine just a few years before, and then the Arabs came and took it. Naples and Rome that had both been Byzantine until the mid 8th century, and the same goes for Mallorca. So basically we have an object which is very curious, which is culinary specific, that appears all across the empire, east and west. It is though Italians moved around and took with them their gadja to make their espresso coffee machine. They couldn't live without their espresso coffee machine. It was a status symbol to say, I am Italian. So we can imagine perhaps the chafing dish being a state symbol saying, I am Greek because I eat in the Greek manner. Globular amphorae. Well, that's another crazy thing. The, this amphora is produced, the amphora you see in the photograph, is produced at Mitello, which was a kiln site in, um, in southern Napoli, near Otranto, outside of Otranto, by the port. Now, this type of globular amphora is identical to other globular amphorae made in Mycenum, in Campania, probably in southern Italy, for a brief period in Carthage, in North Africa, made on various islands in Greece, made at Kersonesos in the Northern Black Sea, in a Byzantine stronghold. These amphorae became um, the standard for all maritime trade in liquids across the empire. The Romans hadn't been able to achieve this. The idea of a standard was lost in the later Byzantine Empire. But in this period, 7th, 8th, 9th century, we suddenly find that everything is standardized, which means that there is a strong, a very strong um, presence of regulatory systems, of taxmen, of 
of, of, of controllers across the empire for exportation of wine and presumably also of olive oil. So, I don't yet know how much the Western territory of the empire may be considered to have a separate identity from the center. I've shown you a series of elements that shows you how much the Western part of the empire was similar to the center, but I can't believe it was identical to the center because we're living in a different territory. It's in some way removed from Constantinople. So what is Southern Italy at that part of time? What was Southern Italy like? Can we find distinguishing characteristics of the South? And can we even more, I think we can, but time will tell, find other distinguishing characteristics that will be able to say that Byzantine Puglia was different from Byzantine Sicily, that was a bit different from Byzantine Basilicata, and so on and so forth. I feel this can be done. It will take a lot of effort. But there are some traits that we find in Southern Italy that appear specific to southern Italy. Well, one of these is the settlement pattern. Now, the Roman settlement pattern sort of went bump in the night. As far as we can see, there's no or very, very little direct continuity between a Roman estate center and Byzantine villages. Were they all killed? We don't know. Were they taken to slavery? We don't know. And we don't know why Byzantines prefer to live outside of villas than move into villas and live inside of villas. They obviously have moved back towards the Imperium in, in Serbia huts. So, the settlement pattern. Look at this settlement pattern. Here we have a settlement pattern, a very, very dense. Um, number of small Byzantine villages. They've all been recognized during a number of years of work here by my team. They're all on a GIS. We will find more, but I can already tell you that the settlement numbers between late antiquity and the end of the Middle Ages rise enormously, starting from around the 8th century. You see there is a, a drop in the 6th and the 7th, and then all of a sudden, they start rising again in number right the way through to this peak in the 14th century, just before the Black Death. Myriads of centers, and from many of which were DM, DM, DMVs, which we'll be able to examine. So what we did, we then planned fierce and polygons around DMVs and surviving centers. And lo and behold, we suddenly found that the theoretical boundaries of the polygons were actually matching the modern administrative, administrative boundaries of surviving towns. As though to say, these boundaries have been there since Byzantine times. So if we have settlements created in the 7th, 8th century, and they're Theoretical boundaries created in the 7th, 8th century, and they respect modern settlement boundaries and modern settlement pattern, then I think the only logical conclusion is that the larger part of Italian, at least Salento, southern Italy, was formed during this period, 7th, 8th century and so were the boundaries, and so by extension was the road system, the road network. Little, little is due to Rome apart from the links between the major towns that did not, were not born in Byzantine times, but are all of classical date. I'm talking about Lupiae, Brundisium, Veretum, Gallipoli, they were all existing earlier, and so they had their own communication networks that were then linked in during Byzantine times to the plethora of villages. If anybody wants to know more about this reasoning, I can direct you to a, a paper that I wrote many years ago with my student Giuseppe Gravilli, which was published in the fourth National Congress of Medieval Archaeology in 2006. So if we start to look at some of the local traits as opposed to the 
uh, extra Byzantine trades, there are a number of things that seem to be happening in Italy. Well, one in the Greek dialects. Well, certainly Greek came into Italy through uh, Byzantine occupation, not through Magna Graecia, as, as many people said. Um, the leading um, 18th century and uh, 19th century philologist, Giuseppe Morosi, was able to show that the surviving languages or dialects called Greco, we have Greco in Calabria, we have Greco in, in Sicily, and we have similar dialects in, in uh, sorry, in Calabria, Greek and Puglia, Greek in, in, in Calabria, and similar dialects in Sicily, all linked to medieval Greece, Greek. Um, you can see them here. You can see in dark grey in the two maps the extension of Greek, major extent to Greek dialects, so Italy. Whereas the map on the right in lighter grey also shows you the area of extension of Basil I during his reconquest. Not all shapes show traits were necessarily um, intentional. So here I put down another map, and this one is courtesy of Michael McCormick, who wrote a paper on this. And here we have the same two maps. The one on the left shows the distribution of the disease of thalassemia, or what we call here anemia mediterranea, because it's a sort of anemia. It's actually a genetic disorder. And this genetic disorder that alters the red blood cells is actually, strangely, an antidote to malaria. If you have this disorder, you're not likely to get malaria. Here, comparing the two maps, we can see that the major distribution of Thalassia is no longer in the area of early Byzantium, which you saw in the, that map, you see the dark grey, but in the area, hang on, I think I made a mistake here, with the map. No, no, um, look at the map on, on, on the right, the map's on the, on the left. Um, Greek dialects respect the earlier part of the Byzantine Empire before the war of Basil I. Um, the Thalassemia respect the areas that were controlled by Basil I during his reconquest of the 80s, 870s and 880s. I don't think that this is a coincidence, but this is obviously an un un unconscious and unwitting um, leap for local Byzantium. Un un unnecessary and unintentional uh, shared trait. But let's move on. We are searching as well within Byzantine Italy for, um, let's say, elements of unity, of disunity within uh, unity. We're trying to have a, a unified vision of Southern Italy, but we also realize that even something as, as complex as Byzantium is, should be broken up into its separate components, into its separate disunities, and its disunities can often be created by different groups, different population groups, different religious groups, different ethnic groups that were made to come into Byzantium, that Byzantium tried to make them feel Byzantium, Byzantine, but which brought with them things that were not typically Byzantine. Well, Aurea is a case in point, because Aurea is perhaps the most important uh, Jewish Hebrew settlement in southern Italy. Uh, I have put down an 8th century inscription, when well, inscriptions are very, very rare in this area, a lovely 8th century inscription to a woman called Hannah, who was the daughter of a uh, rabbi. And that was found in Aurea. Recent excavation in Aurea also brought to light um, many other things. We know of two 
Byzantine caves. We have now found more burials. We found domestic areas. We found work areas. So there's a lot coming out of the standard Aurea that will characterize Aurea and make it different to other, other settlements. Other curious traits. Well, this is an excavation that I started carrying out in 1999. It is south of Lecce, so we're really in the thick of Byzantine heartlands. When I started digging, I found a pit. Then I found another pit. And then I found another and another and another pit. Well, it took me back to one of my mentors, I think, perhaps it was um, Peter Druitt or David Rudling, who said, well, nobody ever dug pits to throw rubbish in, because if you read excavation reports, almost nine times out of ten in Italy, they will say we have found a rubbish pit. But people did not big dig pits to throw rubbish in. They dug pits for other things. They dug pits uh, usually to conserve what they were going to eat, or to conserve grain for sowing next year, hibernation. Um, well, they had a number of uses, but they would have been storage pits, first of all, and then abandoned. In this case, this big pit, it was not a storage pit, and it was not a rubbish pit, although it was full of rubbish. There's a smaller one next to it, and another small one below. And my interpretation of these pits is that they belong to the category of sunken featured buildings. The sort of buildings that when Gian Pietro Brogiolo found them at Santa Caterina um, in, in Brescia, in the, the north of Italy, many years ago, he said, hooray, we've suddenly discovered the buildings of the Lombards. But I don't believe they are buildings of the Lombards. I believe that they are classical buildings, and I believe that the farmers in these difficult times have moved back, back to Meiti, making what they thought were adequate for housing the rice. I don't think so. So, the strange sunken featured buildings, Rubenhauser. Well, there's another one, Bova, just to show that it's not my wishful thinking. Bova Marina, excavated by Della Coscarella, again dating around the 8th century. Another untypical looking Byzantine house, but not Lombard. It's fair and square, right at the tip of the Calabrian Peninsula, and is Byzantine. If we move on to the island of Sicily and go and examine the lovely excavations of Lucia Archifa, who's also in the project, at a place called Edera di Bronte, she has other strange buildings. Well, these are not sunken feature buildings. These are buildings that, well, they may be slightly sunken. Some of them, the one the bottom left, uh, right, does not seem to be sunken at all. Mm. Buildings with thick stone footings. If you look at the photogrammetry in the lower left, you will see a nice typical rectangular building and a nice round building and its, its corner. Well, it looks as though they've been multifunctional, but the, I don't know, the round building was used for crop, for, for livestock, for storage, and the rectangular building was used for living in. We're not yet sure. Whatever the case, these sorts of circular buildings find their closest parallels in the so-called yurts, which are enormous mm, uh, tents used by people such as the Seljuks in, uh, in central Anatolia. So perhaps you've got people moving, perhaps you've got people moving into the Salento with the sunken featured buildings, perhaps there are people moving into Sicily with these strange uh, circular buildings with, wooden, with stone um, uh, footings. You see, these are what I would have thought were typical 
uh, Byzantine buildings. We have Hierapolis, we have Kersenesos, and we even have a recent excavation of the building from Oria, which is just up the road. In Sicily, turning back to Sicily, these strange buildings also have strange pots. These pots, handmade with grass, not even temper, grass impressions on the outside. Well, they look very, very Iron Age-ish looking. But they have Byzantine and go with those buildings. They're now being examined at the moment, so they will form part of an article that will be appearing, I believe, in the next time I'll give you a video about it. Again, immigration groups. Well, how about this? Moving back to southern Puglia, we have these ceramic pails. You'll see in the uh, top left-hand corner a distribution of these ceramic pails. You'll see that there's one or a small group of Utrint in Albania. And if you go further east, you can just about make out an example um, in Macedonia. Well, they found more examples there dating the 10th century. And look how many in the Salento. So the one in the bottom left is a recent Greek parallel. The other two are 10th century uh, pails, which I personally am starting to believe were either for cooking cheese or yogurt, or just for, um, what do you say, uh, munging the cow. Um, making sure that you get all the milk out of the, the beast. Actually, not so much a cow, but uh, smaller animals such as goats and, and, and sheep. So I'm getting more and more convinced that people are coming into the area because this sort of material culture looks to me very much like the culture of the black shepherds who used to live in the area between Bulgaria and Northern Macedonia. I'm trying to find more, now find out more about their uh, material culture. Another importation, wine, grapes. Well, from my little village in Supersano, I found a, a well full of grapes. And those grapes have been in, in examined genetically with a profile similar to a modern Greek sozi which is not too far away from things like um, Malvasia or Tsauzi from Macedonia, Epirus, Cephalonia. So perhaps Byzantines are also trying to uh, improve the character of the vineyards, if they're really, of the sowing um, of vineyards in, in this area by importing from outside. So this takes us on to food. If you have a good glass of wine, you'll want something to accompany it with. So let's look at some modern food. I'm always hungry. We have the rustico with spinach and ricotta from the Salento. Absolutely marvelous to have a snack or even breakfast. But if you go to Greece, you get the uh, spanakopita with spinach and feta. It's almost the same. The, uh, the crust is slightly different. There's feta instead of ricotta, but they're both the same sorts of cheeses. So why not rustico and spanakopita be the same thing with the Salento having taken over Greek food types, Byzantine food types. And the same goes for your lovely fried pita bread which in Calabria, no longer the Salento, in Calabria is the Lestopita. You can go and buy Lestopita and then you can go to Greece and get the Tiganospomo and find that they're both fried pita breads. Now, how did it get into Calabria? From Byzantine and Byzantine Greece? Or something else yet again, we think of spaghetti as having been brought over by Marco Polo. Well, he did bring spaghetti over, apparently, but not this type of spaghetti, 
made with flour and water, which we call kataifi, and which is also called kataifi in Greece, and which can be used for a whole host of dishes, but which most of you will probably have eaten as the uh, little um, shredded uh, delicacies to the lower right. So I think we'll be able to do a lot of work on this. Now, I, I, I reiterate the fact we have three years time. We now have a team of over 50 people, some of whom are paid for the pro by the project, some of whom are just people who are experts and want to be part of the project because they think they can give a valuable contribution. And that will allow us to do things like study the foodscapes of Byzantium to see if people in Calabria and Puglia and Sicily were all within a large Byzantine uh, kitchen, but everybody preparing their own local speciality. This lovely little book on the foodscapes of Lazio was written by a cultural anthropologist, a certain Rossella Belluso, who studied all the small towns in the hinterland of Rome, studied the same dishes and found what small differences one town's recipe was the recipe of another town. And I've been playing around with this sort of thing for many years, looking at the distribution of animals <coughs> and oil and wine um, and, and the sort of food that would be eaten in different parts of the Mediterranean. These, the animal plots come from a work by Tony King on late Roman uh, husbandry. I've used them for Byzantine times to try and suggest that in some areas, such as North Africa, the Levant, meat was based on mutton. When you start to move into Central Europe or the steppes or even Central Italy, then mutton starts to give way to the common or garden pig. And if you go even further up, then you'll get the cultures that will eat beef. But that is not a particularly uh, important meat in Byzantine times. I hope with all these things that I'm saying at the moment we're preparing for dinner, I hope that I'm helping you to have a little bit of an appetite. I wonder how many other common traits there may be. Modern food driven from Byzantine food. Language, Greek, or which is still spoken by a minority today in Calabria and Puglia, deriving from Middle Age or Byzantine language. Um, religion, Greek Orthodox religion, survived until the Council of Trent in the 16th century, and then survived clandestinely until the 20th century, and now Italy has passed a law to protect these minority groups and minority languages. But the the lovely pizzicata, or the tarantella, la taranta, that you all know that people come to Slen to, to come and hear, because it's, it's a lovely dance based about, about the, around the idea of a woman who is bitten by a tarantula and who goes into a throes of ecstasy, dancing and dancing until she collapses, shuddering to the floor, and everybody dances with her. This is a very strange um, uh, dance that many people have interpreted in the, sen in, in, in the social sense, linked to people working in the fields when those spiders were relatively common. But you see the Taranta is very, 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 very old because at the top right, we have a bas relief dating to the 16th century of the attack of the town of Otranto. And Otranto, the attack of Otranto, the Italian forces against the Turks, are shown as David and Goliath. And so you have David killing Goliath. And to the sides of David and Goliath, you have your Italian local dancers playing the Taranta. So could that be even earlier? Could even that go back to ancient so Byzantine Greece? I don't yet know, but I think we'll know the answer in about uh, 
three years' time. So, you see, the project, in the end, wants to, um, wants to break away, move away from formal stereotypes of Byzantine Greece and Italy, because any book you will buy, any article you will see, any school lesson with young children speaking about Byzantium will show you the stereotypes, will show you the Emperor Justinian in Ravenna, will show you the churches of uh, La Catholic at Stilo and, 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 and the other one, whose name I can't remember, will show you the gold coins of people like Theophilus. Um, that is, to me, now stereotyped Byzantine, Byzantine Italy. It is Italy looking top down, top down in the past and top down today, as opposed to what the majority of the country may have looked like. So together with stereotyped Byzantine Italy, I will also add another Byzantine Italy, which is a reconstruction of the village of Supersano, which I excavated many years ago, that could quite easily at first glance be an Iron Age or a Bronze Age village, um, or even a migration period village, and would seem to have nothing at all that links it to Byzantium, apart from the fact that it's in, uh, right in the center of Byzantine territory in Puglia. It has Greek wine. It has Greek Byzantine type cooking pots. And unless we're going to suspect there's a family of Lombards who came on holiday in Byzantine Puglia, I think we have to interpret it as an original Greek village. So that basically is what my lecture is about. I hope in the end to be able to show that the modern Italian landscape, traditions, food, mm, thoughts, mm, mental pattern, DNA, and goodness knows what else, are derived from 500 years or half a millennium of Byzantine domination of Southern Italy. And if we can do that, I think we're helping to rewrite history. And I think we should also work on public outreach and show people the importance of these remains for the importance of their own story to give them a sense of identity. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't, under, um, I haven't, uh, I haven't overrun the time and I hope that you will find this of some interest. Thank you.